Okay, so thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Actually, I did not come from very far away. IBM Research is just located 400 meters away from here. <laughs> so maybe afterward you can go and have a look. And uh, Okay, so as I've, I was introduced, I was, I'm the technical leader of the group of systems biology at IBM, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we are doing right now. Um, our focus is cancer, but of course within cancer, we are, we are, the focus is to develop personalized medicine approaches for cancer, which sounds very generic. So of course we have some subtopics, and the one I'm gonna be telling you about <coughs> is the one we are, the, the, uh, the effort we are uh, our, uh, pay, paying to develop uh, drugs, uh, to develop uh, models for drug sensitivity <coughs> prediction. <coughs> so just to give you a little bit of a, the overview of why this is an important problem, um, of course, probably you have some of them, for you that are a little bit, uh, have heard about the uh, interest in the topic, might know that uh, the pharmaceutical industry right now is one of the industries with the highest spending on research and development. Nevertheless, the rate of new drugs released into the market is dropping substantially. For instance, this fact that this was very, uh, I found it very uh, interesting to read. So for instance, between the drugs, the, well, the cost of producing new drugs between 1950 uh, and 2010 has increased tenfold, adjusted by inflation. Nevertheless, drugs developed today are more likely to fail in clinical trials than in the 70s. So that means we are spending more, nevertheless, the cost, the, the success rate is falling. And in this today, most of the drug, most of the drugs that are uh, discovered are discovered by chance, not uh, through a systematic effort. So we are not the only team uh, in, the group, in the world thinking about this problem, but the, the idea is that maybe we can use some systematic approaches to incorporate in a systematic way all the data that is available and to develop better models to predict drug sensitivity and new research. So let me state in a, in a different way what is uh, the question that we are actually interested in answering. So as I said before, we are a group that is focused on developing per per med uh, models for personalized medicine for cancer. So we are mostly interested in two questions. The first one is how to know what is the best treatment for a patient. And the second one uh, is sometimes it might happen that for a particular patient we run out of options because maybe some, uh, the, the patient has grown resistant. So can we design an, 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 a drug from scratch? That means there is no uh, drug available, but we design the best drug for this type of uh, disease or this patient. So from a computational point of view, these are two different questions. The first one is a could be thought as a prediction problem. So that means you have your collection of already approved drugs and you try to match patient with drugs. The second is a bit harder, also a bit more interesting and has a higher potential to bring impact to the clinic, is the generation of new drugs. And this is something we are starting now and I will tell you a little bit at the, at the end what we are, the lines we are taking. But for this talk, I will be focusing mostly on this first uh, question. Okay, so I'm gonna be uh, telling you about two different models that we developed to, uh, to address the first question, to, the, to predict the sensitivity of a drug for a particular cell line. So for those of you who are not biologists, I will tell you what is a cell line. Of course, in a real life, we cannot take a patient and just treat it with 100 drugs and see which one works better, because of course it's completely unethical, and the patient is not gonna be very happy. So we work with cell lines. Cell lines are models, uh, they, are approx they, are derived, they are cells derived from humans, they have been modified in a number of ways to make them immortal, so we can have them in, lab, in the lab and replicate them indefinitely. So by doing that, they kind of, they're not exactly like human cells, but it's a good model to do all this type of, uh, of, of this, uh, address all these type of questions. So working with cell lines, the question that we try to um, address is given a drug, this is a collection of different cell lines, and we try to predict drug sensitivity. And drug sensitivity is measured with this score, IC50 value, which tells you what is the concentration of a drug that you have to give to have an effect on half of the cells of your, uh, of your, of your uh, experiment. Okay, and also I will tell you a little bit about the data. Uh, the data we are using is a publicly available data. We have been working extensively with this uh, data set, DDSC, which stands for Genomics of the Drug Sensitivity in Cancer. This is a public resource, it's very comprehensive. It includes information about around, around 1,000 cell lines for which we have all type of molecular information. And you also have the, uh, this cell line have been tested with around 200, 300 compounds, anti-cancer compounds. And we have the values of the IC50 values for each, each combination of drug and compound. So as I said, you have a lot, we have a lot of information from these cell lines. Uh, we have genomic information, that means the information from the DNA sequences. 
We also have transcriptomic information, which is information about the RNAs in the molecule. I'm trying not to be, I know that not everybody's biologist, I'm trying not to be super specific. So transcriptomic profiles just tell you about the RNAs that are expressed in a cell line, and they also convey a lot of information. So what we try to do here is, uh, the first thing, basically, uh, we took transcript, uh, starting with the transcriptomic profiles because they have been shown to be the most informative. And of course, you could think that we could just start with all type of data. The problem is like we don't have enough data to train if you, uh, we are, when you just only considering the transcriptomic profiles, we are talking about 20,000 features, and maybe we have 1,000 cell lines. So of course, in biology, we are always in the situation where we have many more features than samples. So we have always to try to be economical. So our way of being economical was to reduce the number of features that we include. So we focus on transcriptomic profiles. And in this respect, there have been already a number of work that have tried different machine learning approaches. So for instance, uh, random forest has been tried. Random forest, and actually they were able to predict IQ50 values with more or less uh, accuracy. So we were thinking it's like the problem with random forest is like a, it's, it's a random algorithm. So you are randomly, for at each, to build each decision tree, you are randomly uh, selecting, a, selecting a subset of, of, of it. And this is one completely random. The question is, can we use prior knowledge to increase the sensitivity? So this is what I'm doing here. So basically, sorry, so what we did, sorry, I just went, I'm going the wrong direction, apologies, here. <laughs> So basically what we did here is taking information for each drug, we know quite a few of things. We know what are the expected drug targets, and we also know from the alternative data sets, and I'm not going to go too much into this, but we know which, part, which uh, proteins are unexpected to be perturbed when we perturb a cell line with a drug. So basically we, know we develop a modified random forest, uh, random forest algorithm that takes into account all this uh, additional knowledge. And actually what we showed is that, uh, what we call this algorithm NetBite, and actually in the first round what we show is actually, uh, this is the performance of run the comparison, random forest versus NetBite. Here is the correlation with experimental values. So at the first look it seems that we are not doing better. However, when we look a bit more carefully into the results, actually we found out, and that was very interesting, that for certain types of drugs, specifically those that target uh, inhibit membrane receptor pathways, we are doing much better. And this is, well, the, this is, I don't want to go too much into the detail of the biological experiments, but actually when we look at certain drug categories, we did much better. So basically after we're, at the beginning we were a bit puzzled about that, but then we're looking into the literature and we hadn't understood, we found out that it has already been reported that these uh, genes that belong to the membrane receptor pathways are biomarkers for the drug sensitivity. So that means NetBite was able to predict very accurately IC50 values for these compounds, but also was a good tool to predict, to identify biomarkers for drug sensitivity. Okay, so that was our first attempt, attempt to, the, to uh, predict IC50 values. So then is when we move into a, a bit more comprehensive and systematic effort to take, uh, to, to include different diverse types of data. So here, we're having learned the lessons about, uh, back, uh, sorry, about NetBite, we have learned that including prior knowledge and transcriptomic profile help us improve the prediction for certain drugs. So the next question we ask ourselves, okay, what if we, ask, we add even more types of the information? So in this case, I mean, in the previous approach, we're completely disregarding the chemical structure of the drug. So here we, so we said, what if we include the information about the, the 3D st uh, structure of the compound? And in order to do that, we do it, of course, because now data becomes a bit more complex, we decided to use a deep learning approach. So basically here, we have three layers of information. We have, as before, the prior knowledge about the drugs and about the molecular interactions within the cell. We have still the transcriptomic profiles, but now we have this information about the drug structure. And we want, again, to predict IC50 values. Okay, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm not gonna go too much into the details of the model. I'm just gonna tell you that we have basically the way we structure the network, we have two modules. The first one that calls for the gene expression component that basically uh, here we first uh, prioritize certain genes because as I said before, we have too many features. And then we have interesting um, attention uh, and an encoder that somehow uh, um, compresses the expression profile of this gene to make it uh, uh, more amenable to computation. And this is the part that is more novel and, in my opinion, more interesting. Here we are inter introducing this uh, 3D structure of the drugs, and then putting in, we are testing different, I went again to the wrong slide, sorry. So here in this module, we are kind of, we are digesting the 3D, uh, the, the 3D structure of the drugs. 
And here we try different encoders, so different uh, ways of digesting this information in order to uh, maximize the prediction accuracy. So without going too much in the details, we tried attention encoders, convolutional neural networks, uh, RNA networks, and we also develop our own multi-scale uh, autoencoders. The important thing is that we, uh, we experimented with several approaches that based on attention mechanisms. That means once the, the network is trained, you can go back and try to see what were the most informative patterns to make a prediction. So just to give a little bit of, resu of results, actually this, the, our own developed multi-scale convolutional attent attent attentive mechanism was the one that performed better. But maybe better that show you that we did be be better, which of course we did, otherwise I would not be here. Maybe I can show you a little bit about the part I'm talking about attention, because I think this has a lot of potential for the clinical applications. So as I said, once we have trained our approach, we can come back and try to look at as the, as the network, network. Okay, tell me which features were more informative. And we can do that at the level of the drug, but also at the level of the gene. For instance, at the level of the drug, these are an example of two drugs that uh, they are um, officially approved drugs by the FDA, and they are both uh, used for the treatment of leukemia. So these two drugs, I don't know if you can read the labels, but they are exactly the same except for one atom here, where here you have a nitrogen, and here you have a sulfur. So we put both drugs in the same leukemia cell line through Pac-Man, and then we ask here what you see color is the attention that Pac-Man pays uh, to each component. And as you can see, Pac-Man right, rightfully picks the components that are different. So these are the ones that, according to Pac-Man, were more informative to distinguish the HD50 value. And this is as, as we expected. They are, these are the difference between the drugs, so these are the parts that we should, should be picked up. We can do the same with genes, also we can ask Pacman to tell us, okay, so now you have predicted this uh, sensitivity on this leukemia cell line, tell me which genes were informative, and again, we pick up genes that are important for leukemia. So again, this makes sense. The other thing I wanted to tell you about Pacman, uh, everything that we develop at IBM, at least in my team, we made it available to the scientific community as a free web service. So this is, Pacman also have the service, you can create, register for free, just, you just need to create a, 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 an account. And then what you can do is that you can create, uh, basically give an, a compound, select a cell line, and then you will get this type of prediction with attention scores. Okay, so I'm running out of time, so I just wanted to mention very briefly, and apologies for the brevity, what we are doing in that to address the second question, generate prediction of new compounds. So maybe I will just focus in this slide and then I try to explain what we are doing. So of course, predicting, it's, it's very good that we can predict the, the, the sensitivity of a cell line and a compound, but in some cases we might not have the right compound for a cell line. So the next question we want to address is how we can predict a completely new compound from scratch. And for that, we are currently doing thinking about using reinforcement learning. So just to give you a super brief introduction about reinforcement learning, in reinforcement learning you have an agent and environment the agent performs some actions in the environment and gets a reward that could be positive or negative. And then the reward is maximized through iterative stages, stages and the goal is to perform a, complex, a complex task. So the way we are thinking right now is we have uh, our agent would be a generative model that kind of, that in, in, in silico synthesizes new drugs. These drugs can be tested through Pacman to see whether they, are, uh, is, they, they, are, they work on a cell line or not. And then depending on the sensitivity, the efficacy, I keep going to the wrong slide, sorry. Depending on the efficacy, we get a reward. Uh, positive if the, the sensitivity is good, negative otherwise. And then we iterate through many processes and eventually you generate a completely new drug that hopefully will be maximized for this cell line. Okay, so with that, I think I'm running out of time, so I would like to wrap up. So uh, the challenge, I hope that uh, after this talk, you are aware of the challenge of uh, generating, well, first of all, of matching patients and drugs, and the second challenge, or challenge of generating new compounds for cancer or many other diseases for which there are no treatment right now. I have uh, briefly uh, spoken about two different projects. The first, one, the first one is where we have used machine learning and deep learning to um, uh, ingest massive amounts of data and try to predict drug sensitivity. The first one in NetBite, uh, we found that we outperformed random forest for certain uh, drug families where the genes are informative biomarkers to predict drug sensitivity. And the second one, Pacman is a, a, a more comprehensive approach to encapsulate different type of data. So we include prior knowledge about drug targets and the molecular interactions within the cell. 
We include, include transcriptomic profiles, but this could be extended to include other types of data. And also we include information about the structure of the drugs. And the nice, the important thing is that really just we can interpret the results. We can see which features were informative to make the prediction. And this is, well, this is something we are starting right now, but I think it's very promising. And I think in the future, we will be able to design their own, their own, their own, uh, our own drug for each particular patient and each particular disease. At least this is my dream. And with that, I will tell you, well, show you that all they have done is uh, in the archive. So you are curious about our method. Yes, I encourage you to visit our web page and look up other projects we are working on. And um, also, I want to be around. So if you have questions, please feel free to drop by and, and talk, talk to me. Thank you very much. So thank you for your talk. Um, you said you have two main challenges. So the first one is prediction, the other one is generation. And I was wondering how you tackle the second challenge. So where do you get your data from and do you also include data like nutrition of the patient? Okay, so about this generation is the one I, brief I, I mentioned very briefly at the end. So that way we use reinforcement learning about, the, so basically we have at least, I, it was very, very fast, I'm sorry. So we have the agent and the environment. The agent is a generative model that using, for instance, information about previous uh, other uh, drug compounds, we generate a, complete, a completely new compound. And then we put it through the environment. Our environment is Pac-Man, that our tool that we develop that can match the, this drug compound and predict their sensitivity on cell lines. So if we do better, we get a positive reward. If we don't do uh, good, we get a negative reward. So that will be the part where we are trying to generate new compounds. Now, you also ask a very interesting question about in lifestyle. Definitely, you're right. I think what we are doing right now, I think it's a good direction, but it's still limited because we only consider molecular information from the cell line or from the drug and some prior information. Definitely, in drugs response, there is a lot of factors can come from the environment. Unfortunately, for at this point, we don't have massive data sets where we can include this data. And, uh, the problem, this is a recurrent problem in biology, in systems biology. We have many good questions, we have many data sets, but many of them are still not publicly available. So I think you are asking a great question, and at this point, I don't see how we could try, with the data we have right now, how we could address this question, but definitely it's something that we have to address at some point in the future. Thank you. I have rather a, a request for clarification than a question. So uh, the environment of this reinforcement learning um, approach is like kind of all drugs available, right? It's all? All drugs, like I'm like kind of, I'm tra transversing or navigating my, <coughs> my model through the space of all potential drugs, right? So the environment here will be Pac-Man. So that means once we have trained Pac-Man and we train it with the, uh, the data which is available right now for this collection of cell lines tested on this collection of compounds. So once we have trained Pac-Man, we can generate a new drug. And of course we have to focus on a particular cell line. And then you test this new ground, this new uh, generated compound on this cell line. So our environment is Pac-Man that's trained on publicly available data. Okay, and is so Pac-Man Pac is also, also returning the reward, like kind of like? Pac-Man will tell you how well or how bad you are doing. So if you do well, you can transfer this sensitivity prediction into a score. If you, your sensitivity of the, for th this drug is very sensitive, as it's very efficacious in this cell line, you get a high reward. If you don't do anything on this cell line, you get a bad reward. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, the Pac-Man gives you a sensitivity prediction, but this is immediately translatable into rewards. Okay. Hello, uh, thank you so much. It was a very interesting talk. I had a question regarding, uh, so you're using gene expression as the features. So have you also tried using uh, other molecular features, for example, copy number yeah. or <coughs> point mutations? Have you, can you comment on that? So this is something uh, we have definitely thought about it because it makes sense. The more data you use, the better your model should be. The problem is having enough data to train. So in order, because only about gene expression data, we are talking about 20,000 features. If you start now adding copy number alterations, somatic <coughs> mutations, epigenetics, you can get into the 15,000 15, features easily. And then you have only 1,000 cell lines and 200 compounds. So at some point you run into the problem of having too many features. So we focus at the beginning only on transcriptomic data because there have been some studies that show, have shown that they have uh, superior predictability. 
but definitely we are still investigating other ways of including other types of data. So I think you are pointing to the right direction. 